Good evening. Many thanks for joining us. This is the news on 19 International. We're live in Abuja. I'm Ruth Aguela. Let's start with the headlines. Latest COVID-19 research finding indicates loss of smell and taste as early warning signs and United States Disease Control Center warns of second coronavirus experience. Economic Sustainability Committee and largest pool of options to address current economic challenges. Nigerian Air Force marks 56 years anniversary amid COVID-19. Let's begin with a global update. The head of the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention has warned that the United States could experience a second wave of the coronavirus. Let's join Joyce Ometu for that update. We begin with Nigeria. As at 11.25 p.m. 21st of April, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control and CDC says there are now 782 confirmed cases of COVID-19 reported in the country, 197 recoveries while 25 people have died. The recent figures registered by the NCDC show that Lagos is leading with 430 cases, FCT 118, Kanu, 73 cases, Oshun and Ogun states 20 cases each, while Rivers has three, and Anambra and Sokoto, one case each. Generally, in Africa, a tally by Worldometer as at 6 p.m. reveal that the continent now has 25,954 cases, 1,202 deaths, and nearly 7,000 recoveries. Let's shift our attention now to other parts of the world. Recent figures by Worldometer as at 6 p.m. reveal that 2,588,584 people globally have been infected with the virus, while 180,016 have died. The death toll in the United States has climbed by 2,751 in the past 24 hours, bringing the total to 45,431. Spain has registered 208,389 cases and 21,717 deaths, while Italy reported 183,000 957 cases. Other countries with over 100 cases include France, Germany and the United Kingdom. In other news, a possible vaccine for COVID-19 developed by a German firm has been given the green light for human testing. The trial will begin with 200 healthy people aged between 18 and 55 being given the vaccine. Russia recorded 5,236 new coronavirus cases in the last 24 hours, bringing its nationwide tally to 57,999. And that's it from here. Many thanks for staying. I am Joyce Umetu. Thanks, Joyce. Let's look at the latest from the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19. President Mahmoud Buhari has approved the immediate payment of, to, of the withheld February and March 2020 salaries of lecturers not registered on the IPPIS platform to cushion the effects of the COVID-19 period on the lecturers and members of, the, of their families. Chairman PTF boss Mustafa said vice chancellors are to revalidate to revalidate the BVN of the affected lecturers before the Accountant General of the Federation can carry out the payments. Isolation, care and case management remain central to our success in this fight. The situation in Kano continues to be of concern and the presidential task force is working in close contact with the state government to arrest the situation. 
The Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 has also attributed increase in confirmed cases of COVID-19 to expansion of testing capacity and community transmission. The Tax Force said the strategy for testing has been modified and door-to-door -door testing is now taking place in some communities in Lagos and Abuja. All right, latest in the COVID-19 research in the world has identified loss of smell and taste as early red flag for coronavirus infection. The United States Center for Disease Control recently adopted this as one of the early symptoms which qualify suspect for tests. Professor Titus Ibekwe, a consultant, surgeon and public health professional, joins us now in the studio. He's from the University of Abuja to expatiate on this new development. Prof Professor, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. All right, uh, another tricky move by the virus, you say, but what's the synergy between loss of smell and tests in COVID-19? Yes, um, you know, the, the COVID virus, that's um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, is really a virus that... Um, um, a lot of information is still being processed regarding it. And more and more new information comes up on a daily basis from the scientific world. Mm -hmm. uh, but over some weeks now, um, the body of ENT surgeons across the globe in different parts of the world, um, we have been talking about this, that um, uh, a good number of the Cases tend to present with loss of sense of smell and loss of sense of taste. And um, this happens, usually happens very early uh, within the period of uh, contracting the disease. Um, from our valuable data, we have it that um, from 30% up to even 70%, depending on different parts of the world and um, the information available. Um, fall within this category. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the mode of transmission of the um, organism itself, we know that the nose and the throat remains the early points of entry of this organism. And when it gets into the nose, um, there are certain receptors within the nasal cavity um, around the special skin that lines the nose, which are divided into two, we have the respiratory epithelium, we have the olfactory epithelium. The olfactory epithelium is the one that senses for smell. Mm -hmm. um, within that uh, respiratory ep epithelium and indeed the supporting cells of the olfactory epithelium within the nasal cavity and the tract. Okay. We know that there you have the um, ACE2, which is the, um, the receptor that uh, uh, the organism usually binds to that's angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, it is more than sufficient within this um, part of the nasal cavity. So that's the first point of entry that the, um, the, the S protein, which is the spike protein, binds. And subsequently, the transaminases within the surfaces, we break them down. And this now triggers off the replication and multiplication in hundreds and thousands of these organisms within the nose. And easily they colonize these receptors, which help in sense of smell. Okay. And once they are colonized, um, they won't be able to perform this function again. It's also known that they can even follow the nerves itself to ascend through the cribriform fossa to enter all the way into the brain and now um, uh, sort of Make deactivate, yeah. yes, deactivate okay. the organelle that's test for sensing. All right. And the sense of smell and that of taste, they are related. Once you lose the sense of smell, taste also goes. All so, right, um, Professor, sorry, let me hold your thoughts there. Yeah. Now, from what you're saying, it's good you're breaking it down for us, but these symptoms, how can it be identified in a person who is suspected to have the virus? Because we know some of these um, um, symptoms that, is, that has been discovered can be found in other ailments. Yeah, this is very true. Uh, but the, the beautiful thing here is that um, the individuals themselves will be able to feel this sense of loss of smell and taste within themselves early enough as red flag. But we know that there are some other conditions that could also lead to loss of sense of smell. 
But if it's known that um, it's only in about 10 to 15 percent, it would in such condition that you can get this. But just look at the disproportionate if you compare um, the percentage of, uh, you know, validity within the, uh, you know, the test point, the number of people that can fall within this category for among those who are cough positive. So it is really very high. And um, once an individual loses either this sense of smell or sense of taste, what we're saying is that that person should even self-isolate himself and, you know, um, uh, get information across to designated authorities, the NCDC in our own climb here, so that the person should be tested. Because as we're speaking now is one of the um, one of the criteria that is already included now by CDC in the United States. And we know that very soon, World Health Organization and indeed our own NCDC is going to you know, adopt this. Okay. So it will help because even people who are carriers, asymptomatic individuals, this could be the only mode of presentation that they could have even weeks you know, before manifestation of fever symptoms, and cough yeah. and other common symptoms right, that COVID is known for. All right, thank you very much, Prof. I know that um, as we, you know, try to curtail the spread of the virus, we'll definitely continue to do our bits, you know, to stay safe all the time. Thank you very much, Professor um, Taito Sibikwe. All right, let's thank look at all the issues arising from COVID-19 in Nigeria. The governor of Kaduna State, Nasiru Erufai, has tested negative for COVID-19 after four weeks of quarantine and strict medication. The governor confirmed this through a non-conventional video broadcast to the people of Kaduna State. Let's hear from Mohamed Umarit Ajingi. While confirming his test results, express happiness over the spontaneous messages of concern and solidarity from all Nigerians and particularly applauded the professional commitment of his handlers from the State Ministry of Health and Borough Deco Teaching Hospital Kaduna, describing his deputy and chairperson of the State COVID-19 Standing Committee, Dr. Hadiza Balarebi, as highly resourceful. We must all work hard to ensure that we keep coronavirus or COVID-19 out of Kaduna State. We have lower infection rates than expected due to the stringent measures we imposed very early in our state. But we cannot let our guards down. We live in dangerous times. This disease is a threat to our humanity, our lives, and our livelihoods. As someone that has experienced it, I will not wish it on my worst enemy. Governor Erufai therefore restated his commitment to ensure more proactive curtailing of the pandemic in Kaduna State through more stringent preventive measures and treatment of the few that fall victim to the virus. In Kaduna, I am Muhammad Umarajingi, NTA News. And in Ogun State, the Federal Ministry of Health through the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and World Health Organization has reiterated commitment to lead prevention, detection and control of communicable diseases of national and international health importance. Lukman Adifaso reports. In the wake of the coronavirus disease globally, countries have continued to employ diverse strategies in the control of the virus. While these initiatives have proven to have differential effectiveness, one approach that has been adopted by several countries is the lockdown strategy, which is a stay-at-home measure to slow the spread of the virus. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control, NCDC, and World Health Organization are leading the war against the pandemic in Nigeria. The team on assessment visit to the state expressed satisfaction with facilities at the isolation centers and the molecular laboratory for testing coronavirus patients in the state. We know that there's no end in sight, at least for the risk of infection, because until we have a, a vaccine, uh, we are not going to be able to completely control this uh, new infection. Your Excellency, your leadership will be so much, uh, so needed, uh, yourself and the other leaders in the state, to. Um, uh, communicate to people in a way that they take ownership and responsibility for the changes in lifestyle that we will have to adopt. The state governor, Prince Dabwabiodun, explained to the team that the state's achievement is through self-help to contain the virus and provide relief for the people. It is my hope that um, 
after this visit, um, it would be easier for um, the federal to have a better appreciation of what we've done. He commended the federal government and presidential task force on COVID-19 for several measures being deployed to contain community transmission of the pandemic in Ogun State. Let's look at some judiciary matters following the continuous lockdown of courts, which has affected all the judicial activities in the country. The National Judicial Council has held its 45th council meeting through video conferencing with all the 24 members of the council participating from their various jurisdictions across the country. Judiciary correspondent Femi Okewo monitored the meeting from the NJC headquarters in Abuja. This virtual meeting of the National Judicial Council has been a long way coming. Indeed, the process was started since 2012. And uh, the situation in the country the, or in the world generally, the pandemic, has uh, triggered this and made it faster. Now, for the first time in the history of Nigeria's judiciary, the administrative body that administers judiciary across the country is having a meeting in Abuja. Good morning, my lord. Presided over by the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Ibrahim Tanko Mohammed, the National Judicial Council is the highest administrative organ of the nation's judiciary. This meeting is a regular one in the running of the nation's judiciary. But in view of the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the items on the agenda of the meeting would be to fine-tune the use of virtual and internet processes for the circulation of court processes and judgments. But for now, the meeting and the administration of the judiciary in Nigeria does not have to draw the physical attendance of members. Like in the case of this council meeting, only five out of the 24 member council were physically present in Abuja, along with the secretary of the council, Gambu Sali. Other members just remained in their jurisdiction and were part of the meeting through virtual processes. In Abuja, Femi Okewu, NTN News. All right, let's take a break. We'll be back shortly, so stay tuned. Action. Make your home the place to be with Day TV Super Cool Kids channels. That sounds fun. From funky friends that will keep even the little ones busy. All right, everybody, let's do this. To learn as you watch educational shows for curious young minds. You can do some amazing things. There's plenty for everyone. Tune in to our kids' shows and get everything you need to keep the kids entertained and learning the fun way. Go TV, love it, love it. Thanks for being there. The Economic Sustainability Committee, chaired by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo, is enlarging the pool of options open to Nigeria in achieving the administration's plan to turn the current economic challenges to opportunity for Nigerians. State House correspondent Gide Onifadi reports that the new sustainability plan is almost ready for submission to the President for approval. Now, the Economic Sustainability Committee is leaving no stone unturned for the new federal government's post-COVID-19 economic stimulus. For example, earlier in the week, on Tuesday to be precise, Chairman of the Committee, Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo, through a video conferencing, met with the representatives of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The committee has been collaborating with domestic sectors of the Nigerian economy. And now the vice president is interfacing with international agencies for the purpose of rolling out options, as President Muhammadu Buhari has directed. What uh, Mr. President has asked us to do is to devise a strategy uh, in order uh, to be able to keep uh, the economy going and also to make uh, provisions to ensure that we're able to retain jobs and in, indeed even provide more jobs. We're looking at uh, various ways and means to support each sector of the economy, provi providing for each sector clear interventions that will be designed to, with the primary purpose of creating jobs and ensuring that businesses stay afloat during these difficult times. The seven-member Economic Sustainability Committee was set up as a response to the challenges in the economic front resulting from the fall in the prices of oil in the international market, 
as well as the disruptive impact of the pandemic that has disrupted the global economy. And it is expected to submit its report soon. And from every indication, the president intends to act speedily on the Oshimbaju Committee's report in the State House. Jide Onifadi, NT News. And from the economy to the environment, if there is any time to take climate sensitive action, that time is now. With the coronavirus pandemic proving to humanity that man can limit his destruction of nature. On NG Fine Face in this report examines the imperatives of action to sustain gains recorded by the ecosystem on the global lockdowns within the framework of the World Earth Day 2020. In the words of Ni Yoshindare Aporet, the earth is ours to plow and plant. Our earth is an unopened greenhouse, a bustling barn in some far uncharted jungle, a distant gem in a rough unhappy dust. This earth is ours to work, not to waste, ours to man, not to maim. This earth is ours to plow, not to plunder. These words bemoan the attitude of man who plunders, exploits and maims the earth for profit and pleasure. Our exploitative use of the ecosystem has led to reduced options for future use temporarily or permanently, as well as disruptions of biogeochemical cycles, as well as emerging infectious diseases, like we're witnessing now. Like Oshundare, the global community speaking against the beleaguered natural world, laid waste by capital pursuits. World Earth Day, celebrated for 50 years now, mobilizes humanity to protect the earth. It's a time to determine that we're going to halt deforestation. A time we're going to determine that we're not going to carry on polluting in the way we've been doing in the past. And in fact, it's time for Nigeria to dramatically shift away from dependence on petroleum resources for national revenue and as well as for power generation. The theme for 2020, Climate Action, presents opportunities for man to rethink his actions to protect rather than plunder the earth. And COVID-19 is forcing the world to do this. There is really so much that we can do as stakeholders to ensure that Mother Earth is preserved. This is the only planet that we have where we actually can live. So it's up to us to ensure that we preserve this Earth. For those who still intend to destroy the ecosystem, like Oshundare, we ask, are they of this earth who live that earth may die? For the health of the planet has direct consequence for human health. And the way we treat the planet determines how well we can live on the planet. But for those who would act to protect the earth, we take comfort in the assurance of the poet that our earth will see again. On Nengiye, Fine Face, NC News. Thank you, Nengiye, certainly. Today marks 56 years of meritorious service from the Nigerian Air Force, and they have been a series of activities marking the anniversary. However, this year's celebration is quite different. Naja Tutijani spoke to the chief of the Air Staff on the significance of the event. It's the tradition of the Nigerian Air Force to display air power on such occasions. And here they come. Sporting green, white, green, the Nigerian flag, the colors of the Nigerian flag, a tribute to what's happening in the country. It's not just about the... Nigerian Air Force celebrations, but the Air Force is trying to raise awareness about the coronavirus pandemic. And with me here is the Chief of the Air Staff to tell us more about this year's celebration, why it's being celebrated on a low key, and what the Nigerian Air Force is doing to fight the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you so much. Um I want to say that uh, today we are celebrating the 56th anniversary of the Nigerian Air Force. You remember that the Air Force was established in 1964. And uh, this year's celebration is low-key because of the situation on ground. The uh, COVID-19 pandemic is a serious problem that is not only affecting Nigeria but globally. So what we have decided to do is to take some time out, at least to remember those that have given their lives so that we all can remain alive and our nation can remain a united nation. 
The NAF says it will continue to look into research and development of ventilators and other equipment targeted at fighting COVID-19. Najat Tijani, NTA News. President Muhammad Buhari has received more condolence and messages from presidents of Guinea-Bissau, General Umaru Sisoko Mbalo, Guinea-Conakry Professor Alpha Conde, Liberia, Dr. George Ware, and Benin Republic, Patrice Gulame Talon, over the passing of former Chief of Staff to the President, Malam Abaykari. Adebola Brooklyn Sunday reports. A statement by the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity, Garba Shewu, states that in a letter, the President of Guinea-Bissau expressed deep condolences and sincere feelings of compassion to President Buhari, family of the deceased, members of staff of the President's office, and the Nigerian people. The President of Guinea-Bissau says Mr. Kiari actively contributed to the strengthening of relations and cooperation between the two countries and will be deeply missed. Others who sent messages to President Buhari are Ambassador of Japan, Mr. Kukuta Yutaka, Head of Mission, Embassy of the Republic of Congo, Omba Olenga, and Charged Affairs, Gambia High Commission, Amadou Tahal. The Embassy of the State of Libya and Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Mauritania, former Principal Secretary to President Goodluck Jonathan, Ambassador Hassan Tukur, and former Minister of Information, Prince Tony Momo, former Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Defense, Nora Tubatagarawa, and Benue State born Professor of Law and Jurisprudence in the United States, Professor Dick Azinge, also commiserated with the President. In another development, President Muhammad Buhari has condoled with the Accountant General of the Federation, Ahmed Idris, over the death of his father, al Idris Hussain. The President, in a statement by Garba Shehu, Senior Special Assistant to the President of Medium Publicity, says late Hussein did not only live for himself but also devoted his life to the service of humanity through his philanthropic deeds. The President appealed to all the well-to-do members of society to borrow a leaf from the noble deeds of the late Idris Hussaini. Hussein. He prayed Allah to forgive the soul of the deceased and grant him paradise. That's it on the news. We do appreciate your company. I'm Ruth Aguilar. Bye.